Hi, everyone. So today we're discussing a paper by Karen Bennett titled Why I Am Not a Dualist. And uh, this is the first in a series of papers we'll be talking about that come from the perspective of materialists or physicalists responding to these major problems for physicalism and materialism. Um, so this should be an interesting, interesting run. We get to revisit some issues and hopefully we all feel like we have a bit more expertise going into them. Um, and so we'll be able to better understand where everyone's coming from. Um, now, quick side note, in relation to this new unit that we're starting, usually at this point in the semester is when we would get a break. We would get a one week break. And uh, that might mean that, that some of us are getting a little tired. I know I'm, I'm a little bit run down. So uh, let's do our best and hang in there and uh, join together and, and help each other puzzle through these problems. And uh, you know, if you're having a, a tough time, please uh, come and speak to me or, or at least somebody you trust. Um, because it is likely that as the weather um, gets colder and as the days shorten, some of us will struggle a little bit. Um, so for all of those of you who are living in the northern hemisphere please watch out for yourselves look for some sunshine take take your sunlight hours when you can um, and just be mindful of your own health and well-being okay so let's start karen bennett's why i'm not a dualist uh this is an interesting paper in that um karen bennett is very opinionated and uh She's standing firm in favor of physicalism. And now the way she's gonna do this isn't so much gonna be by making a case for physicalism, but instead she's going to attack dualism as a position. Um, one other thing I'll say is that the title of the paper, Why I Am Not a Dualist, is modeled after a uh, famous discourse by Bertrand Russell, of which he titled, Why I Am Not a Theist. Um, so this isn't meant to be uh, a literal parallel of the arguments Russell has, or even necessarily a sympathetic take. But you know, it, it, it's fun in philosophy. Sometimes you get philosophers later referencing philosophers earlier with similar titles, and this is one of those times. So um, Karen Bennett says, "Quote: I want to stick with the question of what is wrong with dualism itself." Instead of explaining why I am not convinced by the arguments for dualism, I want to discuss why I am committed to finding fault with them in the first place. So basically she's gonna be defending the stubbornness position, the position that she's allowed to stick to her guns and allowed to stay uh, within physicalism, finding problems with dualism, even though uh, the, the argumentative positions are difficult for physicalism. Quote, the sad truth is that the arguments against dualism are not really all that compelling, unquote. First of all, consider the following three arguments. So there's the argument from simplicity, which we read in Jack Smart, and Bennett thinks that won't convince a dualist. It's circular. Quote, we need to already have reason to think that the physical facts are sufficient for all the facts before we are entitled to shave with Occam's razor she says. Two, consider the argument from optimistic meta-induction. So basically the argument that, you know, science has worked for us in the past, naturalism has worked for us in the past, the assumption of materialism has worked for us in the past, and so it will work for us in the future. This is like induction has worked in the past, and so induction will work in the future. That's the argument from optimistic meta-induction. Um, science has never needed special properties before, right? However, for the dualist, consciousness is special and weird, and so it's supposed to stand out, uh, stand apart from this argument from optimistic meta-induction. It's not included there, and so that argument isn't going to convince a dualist because the, the dualist is already convinced that consciousness is special. Now, the third argument to consider is the argument from causal exclusion. So, physicalists will say that there's a problem with dualism because how do you explain the interaction between the mental and the physical, if you don't follow causal exclusion, it all gets messy. Maybe we like causal exclusion. Why would we think that there are other kinds of properties that can have causal effects, right? However, 
Uh, dualists have no reason to take causal exclusion seriously because why should they find it such a problem that there might be a different category of events that can have causal effects on physical events? That's, they're just gonna reject causal exclusion wholesale. That's not gonna be something that convinces them. So these three arguments in favor of physicalism and sort of against dualism aren't really effective at con convincing the dualist. So basically Karen Bennett is acknowledging that the landscape in favor of materialism at first glance looks really poor. Why be a materialist? We don't have very many good reasons, especially if we start out as dualists, like you might not be compelled to switch sides. However, she says her paper isn't gonna be covering those kinds of arguments, arguments in favor of physicalism because there's positive reasons in favor of physicalism. She's coming up with a new objection and here's what she has to say about it. Quote, the new objection is basically this. Dualists do not excuse themselves from all demand for explanation simply because they deny that consciousness can be explained in physical terms. They still owe us an explanation of something else, namely the ways in which the facts about conscious experience, henceforth phenomenal facts, are related to physical facts, unquote. So what she's saying is that dualists still have to explain something about consciousness. And it's not gonna be the same explanation that physicalists owe about consciousness. It's gonna be an explanation of the ways in which kind of the phenomenal is related to the physical. So fine, maybe, maybe the phenomenal doesn't arise from the physical or maybe the phenomenal is separate from the physical, but we still have to be committed to some claim that they have a relationship. Most modern forms of dualism say that, and that is something that still has to be explained. And that's kind of a big thing to have to explain. So her main objection to dualism is basically that their explanatory work is just as daunting as the explanatory work of a physicalist. And that for her, that's good enough reason not to switch out from physicalism, to stay with physicalism and the physicalist project because the other project isn't any more promising. So let's get a little bit more clarity on what it is that Bennett is asking of the dualist. What is she asking for in terms of explanation? She says, I'm not asking for a constitutive explanation that is an explanation of what phenomenal properties are made out of, right? We don't need to know what kind of stuff the phenomenal properties are made of. Implicitly, we've accepted that the claim is that there's other kinds of stuff um, because that thinking that's the explanation we need would be to kind of misunderstand the dualist or underestimate the dualist or not, not, not take the dualist seriously or something. Um, she also says she's not looking for a causal explanation. She's not saying that the thing that we're missing is an explanation of how the mental and the physical interact um, because presumably we can just cite a new causal law or like a new inductive generalization or a new set of predictions or something about how the mental and the physical are related. And the dualist is just going to say something like that about mental and physical causation anyway. So that's built into the theory. She's like, I'm not looking for that. Fine, I can I figure that, that there's a way to explain that. She is actually looking for an explanation of the correlations between physical and phenomenal events. So not the causal information, not like how my hunger causes me to reach for a sandwich, but an explanation of why when I put NaCl, sodium chloride, on my tongue, it tastes salty an explanation of why when I drink orange juice in the morning and then brush my teeth and then drink a little more orange juice, it tastes different, right? <laughs> the first time it tastes sweet and delicious. The second time it tastes like gross and kind of acrid, right? Um, that's the kind of thing she wants an explanation for. Why should these physical events be correlated with these particular phenomenal feels? Why? Why are there any phenomenal feels? Why are there any correlations in the first place? Um, and why are there neural correlates of phenomenal experience at all, right? Why do the physical circumstances change the phenomenal feel in predictable ways? That she thinks is the sort of thing that the dualist cannot account for very easily. It's not that they can't account for it at all. There's all kinds of theories, I guess you could postulate about the relationship 
um, and the correlations, but we need an explanation that's going to be sufficient. That's going to be simple enough that it can explain the correlations across the board um, without postulating, you know, like a million different laws for these correlations, right? A law for toothpaste and a law for tea and a law for apple pie, right? <laughs> like all of these different tastes shouldn't need individually their own correlate uh, laws, right? Um, we should be able to provide a systematic explanation. And that's kind of what she's suggesting the dualist is gonna struggle to provide because there's no intuitive connection between particular brain states and particular phenomenal fields um, especially if you're a dualist, because then the correlations are entirely contingent. There's, there's no necessary reason for uh, a certain activation in V1 to feel red or for a certain thing on your tongue to taste, I don't know, sweet, right? Um, it, it just, it's gonna, it's gonna be kind of arbitrary. There are gonna be all these contingent reasons why these things come together. And Bennett decides that this problem for dualism is the hard problem all over again, just with a dualist version. So it's not the same hard problem, it's a different hard problem, but it's a very hard problem, thinks Bennett. And so this is the thing that's gonna give us parity between physicalism and dualism. They each have a corresponding hard problem in explaining the relationship between the physical and the phenomenal. It's just that for the materialist, it's explaining how the phenomenal arises from the physical. And for the dualist, it's going to be explaining why the phenomenal is correlated with the physical in, in such a way that there are these predictable um, pairings between physical events and mental events. So basically, both theories have a lot of work to do. And so both theories are equally good and equally bad. <laughs> Um, so with that objection launched, what would the dualists say in their own defense? Bennett imagines the dualist response coming in two forms. The first thing she imagines the dualist saying in response to her is to actually just fall silent. That, uh, there's nothing more to say. The correlations are brute fact or something to that effect. That's the kind of thing she imagines the dualist responding. Um, now, Bennett acknowledges like, okay, well, I realize we're, we're recurring to these foundational properties in order to explain conscious experience in the first place. And so maybe there's just like lots of these new foundational properties or lots of these new foundational laws or bridge laws, that could be a response. However, Bennett thinks it won't work. And she has kind of two sorts of replies to this particular first response by the dualist. It won't work because it would be unacceptably mysterious, Bennett thinks. Some people have even used the fact that it's so mysterious why oranges should taste the particular way they do and, and be associated with the particular physical events they are. Some people think that's so mysterious that that requires an additional explanation and that explanation must be something like God. You need this like force to explain the, the con conjunction of the, the correlated events. And Bennett thinks, look, even people who might accept these different ontological properties existing seem to want an explanation there there's a need for it not to be mere brute fact. The brute factiness isn't explanatorily um, compelling. And so that is what causes people like Robert Adams to say that that thing we haven't explained must be explained by something. Why not explain it? Because God exists, for example. So Ben, it's like, you, you, you can't think you don't need an explanation here. It seems urgent. The second thing she says to the dualist uh, about the falling silent response is that there would just need to be way too many brute facts for it to be a plausible response. So fine, it is part of the dualist strategy to say that there's these like new foundational properties or new foundational substances or new, new brute things that need to exist to explain consciousness. But Bennett just thinks there's so many phenomenal properties that need to be accounted for 
and so many physical events that they're correlated with that if we're going to respond that all of these things are just brute facts, there's going to be millions of brute facts. And it might be hard to give a simplistic account, like only a couple of things that then explain all of the other brute facts, which is what you would like for a, a good, simple theory of the world. So Bennett just thinks that the, the falling silent brute fact response is not gonna sit well with most people. Um, and it's not gonna convince a physicalist to switch over to dualism. It's just explanatorily costly. The second response Bennett imagines the dualist giving to her hard problem argument for dualism is to have the dualist say, let's postulate just a few irreducible psychophysical laws that explain all of the psychophysical correlations. So why don't we try to give that small set of things that explains like, all of the visual experiences, for example, and a small set of things that explains all of the taste experiences, for example. It might have to be even more simple than that. But let's suppose that, that that's the goal, that we could just find a couple of psychophysical laws that explain the correlations in a convincing way, and not too many of them, so that we don't feel like we're propagating brute facts ad infinitum. So that's a, a response maybe that dualist could give. Maybe we're optimistic that we can find these psychophysical laws. Bennett has two replies to this reply. So two counters to this reply strategy by the dualist. The first counter is that she thinks there's tension in the very notion that you could investigate by using science to find these psychophysical laws and still be a dualist. Uh, basically, she's saying that there's a tension in the very notion of naturalistic dualism. Quote, the physicalist research project and the dualist research project do not differ in their methodology or tools, but only in their predicted outcome. So what she's saying is, why should this make a difference in favor of the dualist? If you're going to have to do science to figure out the laws, why be a dualist as opposed to a materialist or a physicalist. What's the reason why being a materialist or a physicalist? Sorry, my cat got the zoomies. <laughs> so let's resume where we were. So she's saying that the, the problem is there's no reason to be a dualist if you're just going to say that you need to use science anyway, because she thinks there won't be a difference in the kind of science that you do. Now, this calls back uh, some, some things that we were discussing in class last week. Um, some of you pointed out that uh, being a dualist and doing science might actually make for a difference in your research, and maybe it'll make for a positive difference in your research. Maybe actually there are some biases that we could have as materialists or physicalists that if we accept dualism, we'll be more open-minded about and we won't miss some important truths or something like that. So there might actually be a methodological difference in being a dualist scientist versus being a non-dualist scientist. Bennett is disagreeing with that implicitly, and maybe that's something that we can push back on in, in her argument, um, just on behalf of the dualist. She's, she comes out a little strong in thinking that there won't be any difference in the scientific method, but maybe it does matter what your background beliefs are. So that's an open question. I'm not sure that Bennett has convinced me there. Um, so second thing that Bennett says about this counter argument, is she asks, how can you have faith in the march of science, right, if the explanatory gap is what's driving the commitment to dualism? There's the kicker. So remember that the dualist got into the naturalistic let's investigate the laws project because they thought there was an explanatory gap with regular physicalism. Here's Bennett, quote, the more you can see how research in the cognitive sciences can tell us how consciousness arises from the physical, the less secure you should be in your intuition that no purely physicalist story could ever work. You should not be at all confident that your ability to conceive of a zombie world reflects a problem with the physical rather than with you. <laughs> so she's kind of suggesting that the problems the dualists found with the physicalist conception of the world 
may reveal in this in this response that they're trying to have to her hard problem that there's actually an issue with their ability to conceive of the truth or something like that and not not an issue with the physicalist methodology so that one seems a little tougher for the dualist to respond but maybe you can think of a response on behalf of the dualist now here's a second counter argument that she gives the dualist trying to give this like argument that maybe there's a few irreducible irreducible psychophysical laws that they can find to explain all of the psychophysical correlations right she says that this strategy won't actually make progress on the hard problem at all bennett says consider the two macro correlations uh, sorry consider the macro correlations between the macro phenomenal and the micro physical how are those going to be explained according to the dualist well you're going to need either some phenomenal minimal fundamental properties or you're going to need some proto phenomenal minimal fundamental properties or something like that but she thinks that another hard problem will arise either one of explaining how the proto phenomenal arises from the physical or the one of explaining how the phenomenal arises from the proto phenomenal so if you think that the most fundamental things are proto phenomenal you're going to need to explain how those add up to produce something that's fully phenomenal which is a really hard problem the combination problem or you need to say that we're starting with the physical and and saying that the the proto phenomenal arises from the physical and that's just as mysterious as the regular hard problem for physicalism like that's not different right um and she thinks that it's important to note that the dualist has to decide whether they're going to be a proto phenomenalist or a phenomenalist about some fundamental stuff some basic things that exist in the furniture of the world as it were um, because if they're proto phenomenal maybe that's not that different from physicalism in the first place because the problem of adding up something that's not conscious into consciousness is just the same problem and if they think that the fundamental stuff includes phenomenal stuff then there's still going to be the problem of explaining how that's related to the physical why there are these correlations so basically there's a problem in column a there's a problem in column b suppose that the proto phenomenal is more physical than it is mental if that's the case then it's the same hard problem and if it's the case that the physical sorry that the proto phenomenal is more mental more phenomenal than not then it generates a problem that's just as hard as the hard problem the one that we were talking about earlier why should the intrinsic qualitative character of an atom or a sub uh, subatomic particle help explain, for example, its structural and dynamic properties. If you think that the proto phenomenal is the most fundamental, and that's the thing in terms of which you explain the physical, then it just thinks now you get an inverted explanation problem where why should the phenomenal underground, like uh, undergird, explain the physical? <laughs> she just thinks that it's like turning the hard problem on its head. Um, how do you get the non-qualitative out of the qualitative? That's something that Bennett thinks is very mysterious. Now, what do you think about that argument? Do you think that um, Bennett is correct that that's just as hard a problem as the hard problem for physicalism? Or do you think that actually um, this is an easier problem, right? In a way, this is like a slightly different formulation of the problem the objection we had in the beginning of the paper the objection at the beginning of the paper is like why do the correlations between the phenomenal and the physical hold like this you know why does sodium chloride taste salty for example why why does orange juice taste acidic um and i mean why in in the phenomenal way right but this second problem is a problem of suppose that you think that the qualitative stuff is fundamental and that everything else is explained in terms of qualitative stuff so like some kind of idealism why should it be the case that something like physical laws arise out of this mental stuff that's the furniture of the universe that's the other problem that she's finding that arises if you end up trying this response this simplistic response where maybe there's a couple things that, that can explain lots of stuff 
right? That strategy yields more problems, says Bennett. Now, Bennett does imagine, because she's a good philosopher, what maybe the dualist would say in response to her arguments. Quote, now suppose that if I were a dualist, I would get off the boat rather early on. Um, I mean, now, yeah. Now I suppose that if I were a dualist, I would get off the boat rather early on. I would deny that I was under any obligation to systematize the connecting laws at all. Right. So she, she thinks that if she were a dualist, she'd take the fall silent strategy and just say, nope, there's just brute facts, brute facts, everything just fundamental. It's just the way it is. There's nothing more to be said. But Karen Bennett says that dualism is still a theory that is subject to assessment and evaluation according to the standards for all of the theories. For example, the standard of simplicity. And you might think that a dualism that postulates tons and tons and tons of fundamental properties or fun fundamental correlation laws or something like that is not that simple. It's a very, very complicated theory. And that will impact it in terms of, you know, us choosing what theories we prefer. We're going to prefer the simpler one. And so this theory that the dualist has come up with, if they're that kind of dualist, is just not going to be very compelling. Still, Bennett thinks that if a dualist wants to say that there's hundreds of fundamental entities previously unaccounted for, or laws previously unaccounted for, you know, so be it, what, what can we do? It might be true, right? It's, it's still a theory, it's self-consistent, but it won't make that theory any more plausible according to the standards that we should have for theories. So we don't have any good reason for preferring that over any other theory right at the moment. So the crux of Bennett's paper is that physicalism is preferable to dualism still, even though, as we've established, there are some arguments against materialism that are kind of compelling, and there's not a lot of good pro arguments in favor of materialism or physicalism that are equally compelling. Bennett says the following, quote, what I am saying is that there are at least two things that we might want an explanation of and that they are tied together. Consciousness itself and the ways in which consciousness arises from the physical. In refusing to explain the first, the dualist renders herself unable to explain the second. So, right, so consciousness and how consciousness arises from the physical. So in refusing to explain consciousness itself, the dualist renders herself unable to explain how consciousness arises from the physical. Quote, the physicalist in contrast thinks he can indeed explain the first or she. If she can, the second will fall into line as well. So if the physicalist succeeds in explaining consciousness, then presumably the physicalist will also succeed in explaining how consciousness arises from the physical. So she's more optimistic that physicalism will work out because it's the one that already had the methodology that was working out that is promising that even some dualists want to rely on for continuing to be dualists. So Bennett just thinks, quote, dualism simply does not help, unquote. If you're interested in solving the problem of consciousness, Bennett thinks that you're no better off being a dualist than being a physicalist. And that's just as good a reason as any to still be a physicalist if you started out being a physicalist. Um, as she says, this is an argument for stubbornness. <laughs> it's an argument for remaining stubborn as a physicalist. It's not necessarily a conclusive argument that physicalism is true. But I don't know. I think she makes a really interesting case. I'd love to hear what you all think. And I'm sure Jaja here would love to hear what you all think. Um, thanks, everyone. And I'll see you soon. Bye.